Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this concept of uh, what I believe every Christian needs to remember. But before we get started, I read a hilarious article recently. And it's about um, the delta between the boomers and the millennials. Now, I'm in the middle. I'm an Xer, right? I'm a Generation X, which if you were in youth conferences in my day, the X was a symbol for Christ. And we were Generation Jesus. Okay, some of you, you haven't been in church long enough to respect some of these things, okay? So millennials and, and, and uh, boomers, you don't have what we have. Generation X, we have the symbol of Christ. Uh, but the millennials and the boomers, fascinating interaction right now, which is basically my children, or a little bit older than my children, and my mom. And it's awesome to watch the interaction, right? Um, Because technology and the language that these these millennials speak and the language that the boomers speak are so different. So here's the article I read. You gotta check this out. It's somewhere in the the internet. And it was um, the, 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 the funny things boomers won't let us forget. The funny things boomers won't let us forget. And I have a ton of them, okay? Like, I have a ton of them I don't want to get into, okay? Like, the boomers will never let us forget emojis. Like, boomers use emojis more than anyone. You just don't use them right. (laughs) We're like, I'm at the hospital, and you keep sending thumbs up. (laughs) And the whole world is going, what? You know, like, the, the laugh till you cry face, like, my dog just died, laugh till you cry face. Like, no, that's a laughing emoji. Anyways, I love it so much. <laughs> I had a 68-year-old man send me an emoji yesterday. It was adorable, and I'm not getting into it because I think he's here. So the point is, <laughs> things boomers won't let us forget. Here's number one, um, that when you watched television, there were three to six channels. That's all there were. And you tell, apparently, millennials have, have gotten together and discussed that boomers keep telling us that when they grew up, there was CBS, NBC, ABC, no ESPN. Now, that's the most tragic part of the story, that ESPN was a, a later invention of which I cannot live without. Oh, I'm a bad guy, okay? I need ESPN, all right? I need my wife, my kids, Jesus, and ESPN, all right? And golf. It is what it is. But they say, millennials say, boomers always want you to know that they had very few channels growing up. Here's a funny, this is is real polls taken. Millennials uh, have told us that boomers evidently won't let us forget that they, that they they didn't wear helmets when they rode their bikes. This is like a thing you guys love, you boomers. I love you boomers, by the way. I love you so much, you raised me. Everybody relax, okay? Some of you boomers are looking at me like, you don't get us. I do. You were my dad. You were my mom. I totally get you. You raised me. I've heard you talk about no helmets all the time. All the time. By the way, but boomers are also like the biggest helmet people for their grandkids. You must wear a helmet. And the grandkids are going to get a little older, and they are. And you know what they're going to tell you? You didn't wear a helmet. It's going to get real awkward. But here's my favorite, and there's so many more, I wish we could get into them more, but they only give me a couple hours to speak. (laughs) The water phenomenon is interesting, right? Have you ever had a boomer conversation about water? You you know, you know, like, like, uh, was it, what what company was it? uh, The one out of France was the first, not, not Perrier, But Evian, yeah, Evian, that was, do you remember when Evian came out? I remember when Evian came out, and I remember vividly my mom, who also at the time was taking us to Taco Bell, Taco Hell. If you own a Taco Bell, God bless you, we'll pray for your business. But the point is, like we were into Taco Bell, but my mom found out they were selling water in a bottle, and that it cost like $3. And she's like, that is ridiculous. Come on, boomers, you remember these days. Now you're like, bottled water, please? Right, but Evian came out and we were like, that is, that is gross. That is excess, that is excessive. Because millennials say one of the top things, if not the top things, this is hilarious, boomers won't let us forget, is you drank from a hose when you were a kid. <laughs> what are you doing? Drinking water. Right, and like, you still want all of us to drink out of a hose. And we're like, nah, this has good pH. I'll take this, you know. (laughs) That one got me. I will never, my dad, like, ah, you know, son growing up, we just drink from a hose. 
walk uphill both ways, to and from school, in the snow, with no shoes. <laughs> Dad, really? <laughs> Things boomers won't let us forget. Well, I hope today there are some things you never forget about the story of Jesus. Some things I think Christians are prone to forget, but should never forget. And of course, you, we must go back to the Hebrew narrative, right? You have the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as it's been called, which was simply a title given to it. God never called it Old Testament, New, Co New Testament. He called it, you know, an old arrangement relationally and a new arrangement relationally. To be honest, the Bible is old relationship, new relationship. It's the new way to live and the old way to live. I mean, that's what it is. The Old Testament, New Testament was a, a title we, we, we gave to it. The chapters and verses are what we gave to it to help us navigate uh, the different portions of scripture. But don't get hung up on titles that were not given necessarily by God, but were given to us to help us understand the delineation and the difference. But really, its best way of calling the Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible, because it's almost uh, completely written in Hebrew, where the New Testament would be mostly Greek and some Aramaic. So really, you have a, a Hebrew portion, and you have a Greek and Aramaic portion, and one is one way of relating to God, and the other is now the new and only way to truly relate to God as revealed through the person of Jesus. Now, much has been made about the Hebrew Scriptures, but I want to remind you, as culture begins to grow and uh, the Hebrew Scriptures come up under intense scrutiny because of what some people think is their inconsistencies, I want to remind you that our faith does not hinge on whether or not there was a real Red Sea. And I know you don't like that, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. Our relationship with God hinges completely and entirely on the birth, life, ministry, teaching, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ from Nazareth. That is our belief system. And so the Hebrew scripture is divine. The Hebrew scripture is beautiful. The Hebrew scripture is necessary, but it is important for us to understand that the way we relate to God is now different. The fullness of God has been revealed in the person of Jesus. Now, one of the overarching themes and overwhelming emphasis of the Hebrew scriptures is this idea of remembering, recalling, and revisiting the faithfulness of God. And that is one of the sacred practices of our journey and our belief system. And one of the reasons we gather, one of the reasons we gather in buildings, one of the reasons we gather in homes, one of the reasons we gather in parks, one of the reasons we gather in donut shops, you know that there are an owner of a donut chain, a national donut chain in this country, and, and they have uh, attached to church home to practice their faith, and these donut shop owners now are opening their donut shops on Sunday for people to come eat donuts, practice their faith with church home and grow in their relationship with Jesus. So there are people in Kirkland auditoriums. Yeah, it's clappable. It's amazing. But there are people in donut shops in Jersey right now. And they too are practicing. One of the sacred practices that we hold is the remembering, the reviewing, the recalling, and the rehearsing who Jesus is, what he did, what he's doing, for what he did and who he was is who he is and what he's doing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is also, I believe, imperative for us in these unprecedented days where so much is seemingly in an upheaval. Even the constructs of our culture and society seem to be up under incredible scrutiny in today's era and age I think it's all the more imperative that we go back to the first Christians. We go back to that day on Golgotha when Jesus hung there for six hours suffocating in his own blood and then was buried in a borrowed rich man's tomb and rose again on the third day like he promised. It's imperative that we go over this again. I've said it tongue in cheek before, but I did pick the best job available because my job is the job as a preacher and a storyteller and a speaker and a pastor. I get to stick to the same script every time we get together. How good is my job? 
I don't have to come up with anything new, and I like it. So I love people who email our church. Judah always seems to be talking about correct. And your indictment is actually, uh, it, it absolutely is like an award. So thank you for the emails. I wish Judah would not just talk about just the gospel story. Oh, it has only ever been about just the gospel story. Now, by revisiting and recalling the early Christians, we're going to discover something very powerful, and that is when the tomb was discovered empty, Christians completely changed. They completely changed. And I wonder if today we need to rehearse how they changed and why they changed so we also are changed. If you're like me, uh, I, I'm going to name drop, prepare with me. I was on a phone conversation with Bishop Jakes two weeks ago. I know, it feels great saying it, I'm going to be honest with you. T.D. Jakes, one of my heroes and board member here at Church Home, and so I called him. I always get nervous calling Bishop because I don't know, you know, what, what, what would he be doing? Am I interrupting, you know? And I called him, he goes, oh. actually, I was going to use a different voice, but he's like, hello, man of God. And I go, hey, Bishop, how are you? You know, that's how it always sounds in my head when I hear his voice. And he's like, and what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know, what are you doing? You know? And he's like, I'm driving in my car. And suddenly I'm like, that sounds so amazing. Where I'm like, ah, I'm just cruising around the streets. You know, like, and he's like, I have plenty of time, let's talk. And then I start to get breathy, okay. You know, no. But we were, we were talking and he said, you know, Judah, I drive conservatively now. And I said, oh, that's good. And I'm thinking, I should probably do that. But he's like, you know why? It's because the older I get, the more of the fragility of life becomes apparent to me. And I, it occurs to me as a 60-year-old man, I, believe, I for, actually forget his age and what he said, that I could die out here. And I thought, isn't that what happens in our human existence? The older we get, the closer we get to death, and we start to think, forgive me for sounding kind of uh, brash, but we, we think I could die soon. And so by nature, the human condition lends itself to fight death at all cost, so we get safe. We get safe. Now, you're not going to like this, and I'm not even going to go on record to say that I like this, but safety and Jesus are not always together not as we define safety. Eternal security, they always go together with Jesus. But convenience and comfort in your temporary human existence, that and Jesus are not always together. In fact, one could argue upon investigating his teachings and the trajectory of his life and ministry that actually it's quite the opposite, that with Jesus comes an inconvenience and an uncomfortability, and a, almost a necessity to depend on him every day for where he's taking you, you've never been before. Now that sounds like Jesus. So if you're here today and you are celebrating your convenience or your comfortability as somehow a reflection of your super spirituality, I would just tell you to keep that to yourself because it's not good proof. No, no, if you feel like things are in an upheaval, if you feel like things are unsettled, if you feel like you're not entirely sure what the future holds, you may be in step with Jesus. He's constantly making the status quo uncomfortable. Even church folk, even pastors and preachers and teachers of the Torah Jesus would always be nudging people in a way that was like, wait, you accept who? You're okay with who? You be wait, what? So today we have come together, not just to remember, but by remembering, we do some changing. So if we're honest now, because I'm doing a message called what every Christian needs to remember, I want to remind you that by remembering what I think you need to remember, you might change, so prepare yourself accordingly. Because the thing we fear most oftentimes in our modern culture is change. 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 
Why are we changing? What's changing? I got news for you. The path with Jesus is filled predominantly with change. Change. And you know what's wild about change? Ready or not, here it comes. Your baby was four foot nothing, and now he's six foot five. And you're like, don't you have a bad attitude with me? <laughs> I was watching Chelsea walk with him. We call him L Dog, but my little nephew calls him L Gog. So I start calling him Gog. And then I realized publicly, people are like, he calls his son God. <laughs> Anyways, so. Chelsea's walking with Elliot the other day, our six foot five year old, and our six foot five year old. That's a good. <laughs> Sometimes God's just in it, man. He's just with me. And Chelsea's walking, and she literally is like this. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Scott. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is bizarre. If she's not careful, she's gonna get a kink in her neck. Just talking to our son. Times, they are a changing. Your body. Changing. At my age, I wake up. Any 40 plus year olds know what I'm talking about right now? You wake up and you go, first thing you do, whether you are conscious or not, you check in with your body. You know you do, and I know you do. You go, oh, hips feel pretty good. Hey, <laughs> right? Like, you're like, oh, my neck, that pillow worked. My neck feels good. You know it's true. And those who deny it believe Pilates covers it up but you're still changing, you're still changing, right? I'm the guy who stretches at Disneyland. You know those kind of people? I remember I was a kid at Disneyland, and yes, I'm privileged to even say I went to Disneyland as a kid. I realized that because my grandmother in her third marriage married for money and he paid for everything. Somebody say praise the Lord. So I'm not saying I'm for divorce, but if you're gonna get divorced on the third one, find you some money, all right? Because the grandkids will be happy. Old Grandpa Nick, God bless him. He's moved on now, but he paid for Disneyland. But you remember getting Disneyland, I was sitting in line, and I see, I see old guys like, mm, uh, uh. Lewis, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh. Right? And I'm like, what are they doing? Calisthenics in the line for like, you know, the Tomb Raider ride? But you know what's worse? Watch the same guy get off the ride. And he's like, oh, man, <laughs> right? I'm like, the other day, the other day, like, Dad, we need to go, like, to Magic Mountain and the Matterhorn, like old school Disney. And I was like, both rides are off limits for me now at my age. Matterhorn, absolute nightmare. Never go. It is just like, it was built in 1974. And everything is like a small collision. Everything. Imagine having a head-on collision downtown Kirkland. That's the Matterhorn. Every turn, right? I can't even make it past the beginning of the ride. You know where they start and stop because somebody's not in? I'm like, oh, no, I got to get off. We're 30 seconds in. Son, get me off. Dad, the abominable snowman, he's not real. Jesus is real. I love you guys. None of this is in my notes. <laughs> I don't have notes. <laughs> the things... We need to remember, will cause change. So prepare yourself accordingly. They're going to adjust your priorities. They're going to adjust how you use your time and your money. They're going to adjust who you speak to. They're going to adjust who you give eye contact to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remembering Jesus can change everything. But I, I want us to look at the first Christians. And, and here's what I want us to go. I want us to go to Silent Saturday. Now, I know Silent Saturday was yesterday. I know Good Friday was two days ago. But I, I want to talk about Silent Saturday because Silent Saturday and Supernatural Resurrection Sunday are quite different for the Christian. Silent Saturday reveals the nature of human beings, whether you believe in Jesus or not. And that is we are prone to doubt and we are prone to be fearful and we are prone to preserve our life nearly at any cost. At any cost. I mean, I don't know what age it happens, but there's an age where when somebody says you look older, it's one of the great insults you could ever receive. 
But back when you were 12, someone's like, you look 24. And you're like, yeah. I don't know when it happens, but it happened here a long time ago. The way you compliment me now is, man, you look so young. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Right? Imagine me in 43, someone's like, you look so old, bro. Like, that's never a compliment. So we avoid death. We avoid aging. We avoid looking like we're close to dying. Right? No one's ever looked at you and said, like, you look like you could die soon. Are you okay? <laughs> right? That's just things we put on the internet, but we don't tell. Oh, okay. Anyway, so we, 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 we're, we're humans. We're very average, normal humans. And so if you give us enough time, we'll avoid death at all costs. So it was for the first Christians. They had spent a few years with Jesus and seen his teachings and witnessed his miracles or at least heard of them. By the time we arrive at Silent Saturday, Jesus is gone, and guess where the Christians are? Now here's where it gets interesting, because as we zoom in on where the Christians are the day before Easter, it starts to shed light on why some of us Christians are where we are too. The evening the disciples gathered together, John 20, and because they were afraid of reprisals from the Jewish leaders, because they were afraid, because they were afraid, because they were afraid, because they were afraid. If you can't relate with the line, because they were afraid, um, you are a clone and you must identify yourself. <laughs> For the rest of us, because you are afraid, is hopefully something you can almost immediately relate to. What have you ever not done because you were afraid? What decisions have you made because you were afraid? What thing did you not do because you were afraid? What thing do you regret because you were afraid? What fell apart in your life because you were afraid? What do you justify now that happened in your life because, if you're honest, you were afraid. Well, if I put my list up on the, on the, on the screens, it, we'd have to scroll because there's a lot. Here's all the things I've done because I was afraid. They had locked the doors. I also attach to that. We lock our doors every night. You've heard me talk about this. I think it's a pretty comical thing. I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's Schledge. Is that the company? Schledge is our most prominent lock here in the United States of America. And if you own Schledge, God bless you. We love you. But I don't think, what is it? Schledge? Chalet? Is that true? It's called Chalet? What is it, French? Chalet? What's that? Chalet. I love you. We'll talk after. We're friends. <laughs> the point is, like, you're like angry, you know? Thank you. Anyways, there's a lock company that we all, I can see the, the name and the writing. I just don't know how to say it. But I love how when we deadbolt, we're like, we're good. <laughs> Last night, I, you know, it's my job as the man to walk the house. And I came down, I noticed that the door to the garage, the chalet, was unlocked. It's a prominent company in this country. Amanda, how are you? She's from Canada, so I'm filling her in. So I noticed it was unlocked, and, and this is no word of a lie. I locked it, and something inside of me was like, my man. You know what I mean? No, you weren't there. Nobody was there. But I locked it, and I was like, that's what I do. Protect the family. That's how I roll. Like, I'm so protective of the family, I'll put an old broom handle in the sliding glass door. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's where I'm from. I'm not a millennial. I'm right after the boomers, and I still use the broom to keep the sliding door so the bad guys don't get my family. Say something. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> put the broom down and lock it. <laughs> what am I, safe? We're the funniest people in the world. <laughs> we're good. Like, we're not. We feel like we are, right? So I understand locking the doors. I do that every night. It's my thing. Why do I lock the doors? Because the whole family's afraid. I'm not. I trust the Lord. 
<laughs> Kidding. I'm the biggest scaredy cat in the whole wide world. I'll be downstairs, downstairs, and our bedroom is upstairs. And Chelsea will go upstairs. I go, where, where are you going? And she's like, I'm going to bed. I'm like, so soon. <laughs> Should I come with you? <laughs> and it's not for sex. It is often. But typically, it's because I'm afraid. <laughs> How could I be on a floor by myself? <laughs> what shall I do? So I understand being scared, locking the doors. And it says, suddenly Jesus appeared among them and said, peace to you. And so the story begins. But this, of course, is Resurrection Sunday, and they're still in the room. But Silent Saturday, they, they were in the room. And right after his death and burial, they were in the room. And that room was locked. In the room was the most prominent Christians on the planet. I'm going to say it again. In that room were the most prominent, powerful Christians on the planet. In that room. Now, Paul wasn't there yet. He will be. We're going to recruit him on the team. But for the time being, he was working with the opponents. But you got all the disciples. By the way, you have the women. And without the women, the church would have never worked. It was two women that were the first to testify of the resurrection. If not for women, we might still be in a locked room by the way. But those Christians in that room, we now celebrate their statues of them and there's cathedrals named after them and we have commemorated them and we call them saints. And you know what they are? Normal. And you know what they were doing? They were in a room and locked the door and hoped they wouldn't be harmed. And that's where they were. And so I put before you today this concept, that it wasn't until they discovered for themselves that the tomb, in fact, was empty. Now, I got to be honest with you, it doesn't hurt that Jesus walked through the walls and appeared in visible form. That's helpful. Now, I will say, apparently, it was necessary, because that's how scared they were. One could argue, logically, that Jesus hasn't walked through the walls of your locked rooms because maybe you're not nearly as scared as the first Christians. But they needed him to appear. That's how scared they were. That's how determined they were to keep the doors locked. I love Jesus too. Jesus could unlock the, the chalet and walk in. You know what I mean? All of a sudden the, the door could go, shoo, whoo, shoo, whoo. hey guys. And I'd be like, whoa, how'd you get in? Do you have a key? But I love Jesus. He walked through the wall to say something by walking through the wall. Do you know what I mean? I love that about Jesus. He's like, ah, I could take the door, but when you're God, why not go through the wall? <laughs> He's like, Whoo. hey guys, ha! Ah! So here's the thought. My first observation, what every Christian needs to remember is that without the empty tomb, we're still scared. And some would argue rightfully so. Without the empty tomb, the life of a Jesus follower or a Jesus worshiper, even though, of course, without the resurrection, we must conclude that Jesus was merely a man. It's the resurrection that was the final proof and testament that he is, in fact, who he said he was. But without the empty tomb, we are still bound by fear-based decisions. Your life now, before resurrection, it is understandable that your decisions are informed oftentimes by fear. But now your decisions are to be informed by faith. Now that can be very counterculture. That can be very counterintuitive in today's world. Because Christians oftentimes, bear with me now, in the Western world are synonymous with how should I say, um, being safe, secure, and protected. But that's not our ancestors. See, our ancestors were locked in a room scared to death because they thought they'd lose their life. But when Jesus walked through the wall, they walked out of the room and said, take my life if you must. Oftentimes people ask, why do you believe in Jesus? Because I don't think millions of people, or I should say at least 
thousands and thousands of people willingly give their life for a fraud. Who, by the way, in the belief system of Jesus, there is no teaching that says if you die for your faith, you'll have a better afterlife. In the teachings of Jesus, whether you live in a castle and eat like a king your whole life or die at burn by the stake, if you believe in Jesus, you have the same eternity. So you could argue, well, other people for other religions die for their faith, but upon investigation, you'll discover that many other religions promise that if you die for your faith, you will have more than other people in eternity. Jesus never taught that. So those who died for their faith in Jesus simply died for love. So I, on this day, am persuaded. But one of the great challenges for me when we start talking about the borrowed rich man's tomb that Jesus temporarily used for approximately three days is it reminds me that my life is no longer to be led by decisions based on protection, comfortability, convenience, and safety. The decisions I make for my wife, my family, and my children are not to be primarily informed by their comfort, convenience, and safety. It is to be informed by the resurrection. So my decisions are not based on what people will say or what people will think, but it's based on Jesus really beat death. And it's the most important story in the world. And so what I do with my money and what I do with my Monday and what I do with my hobbies and what I do with my words and what I do with my eyes and what I do with my body matters. And it will not, those decisions will not be made and anchored to fear. Isn't it odd to you that the conduct and character of these disciples seem to do an about face, almost a 180 before our eyes? The same Peter who said, I will die for you, is terrified until he learns that the God-man got up from the borrowed grave. And these men and women turn into what appears to be and isn't, but appears to be superhumans that we build statues over and we go see where their bones are. I've been to the cathedral where they say the apostle Peter's bones are in that tomb. And though I respect how much money the church is making by giving tours to see Peter's bones, I don't need his bones. I don't need his bones. With all due respect, sir, I don't need his bones. You don't need my bones. Don't ever put a statue in front of me outside of this church. You don't need that. Why, 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 why? Why do we commemorate these men and women as if they're different than us? Because they're not. But did they know something different? Was their preaching just about how to make sure your income increased? Or was the predominant preaching of the early church about how the Savior beat death and how that changes everything? People think, people, people told me you're, you're crazy. You got your kids in the public school system in Los Angeles. I certainly don't feel like it's crazy. The board confirmed that my kids were going to go to public school in Los Angeles. I've told you this before. We've had two guns at my boys' high school this year. And I consider it an honor to have my boys where there is apparent and obvious need. Not that there's not obvious need in every high school in this country. But we're on a mission. And the Smith family will not be defined by comfort, convenience. And I have a lot of comfort and I have a lot of convenience. And I, most days I want more, just to be clear. Okay? My ideal day is probably not in the streets of Los Angeles with my boys in their high school. It's probably on a golf course somewhere making birdies. <laughs> so I am just as prone to convenience and comfortability as anybody else, but the resurrection keeps informing me. It keeps informing me. And he keeps walking through walls I built. You ever, you ever, you ever walled God off in one area of your life? You can have everything, but you can't have my income in my business. You can have everything, but you can't have my kids. 
You can have everything, but you can't have my plan. I need a plan, God. I'm going to stick to my plan. You can have everything but interruptions because we're going to walk out our plan. And without knowing it, oftentimes as human beings, please don't feel guilty or bad about this because we're all in this together. Don't you dare go to brunch, okay, at Tony Romo's. Like, Tony Romo's? Wait, what's that? What did you say? Tony Roma. I called it Tony Romo's. We should thank Tony for that fumbled snap. Remember that? Man, that's a good, that's a good memory as a Seattleite, man. Thank you, Tony. I played golf with Tony one time. I thanked him personally. That's a true story. We're not getting into it. Tony, it's an honor. That's what I said to him. True story. Okay, moving on. Guys up here name dropping. Wherever you go to brunch today, like, please, Enjoy your lunch and don't feel bad. Don't go to lunch and go like, man, I feel so bad. I, feel so, I make so many decisions because I'm afraid. So do I. So do we. So do us. We're all in this together. Like, I love my, my dad's motto was no pain, no pain. <laughs> that was his motto, right? And the older you get, you're like, I'm down. Advil forever. I shudder for the studies that will come out about Advil. We're all going to be like, oh, my word, it's the new Diet Coke, you know. But, but the point is, we're all making decisions all the time because we're scared. I'm just here to be a friendly reminder. You don't have to. You can make decisions that you won't even pretend to know the outcome of. When's the last time you made a decision that was deeply open-ended in terms of what it will bring and the results it will cause? You ever had one of those where you're like, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. And your kid's like, dad, what if? And you're like, God will be with us. <laughs> yeah. Now you understand, you're looking at a dude who from eight years old hit the road with his dad. You know that, right? My dad did a thing called the Dragon Slayer Seminar. My 17-year-old wants to get a tattooed Dragon Slayer. And I was like, my dad never imagined his grandchildren would tattoo his seminar on their body that was evil and ungodly. And now I'm like, fine, bro, I'm not doing it, but you do it. <laughs> we traveled for three and a half, four years. So if you don't know, Chelsea's mom and dad were the number one financial um, provider for our traveling ministry. And obviously, you know, I married out of obligation. <laughs> and I think, oh, come on. God works in mysterious ways. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Amanda, she's the best, right? I love her so much. But this was my life. You understand who I am? I grew up in hotels. Not the nice ones. Not the nice ones. Our parents, my, my mom and dad lived on faith. People had to give our family money for us to live. That was my life. Every trip we went on, it was very likely we were gonna come back to a home that was broken into because of the neighborhood we lived in. This was my life. Now at the time, y'all know what this is like as a kid, you're like, this is awesome, bars on our windows, let's go. You know, like, they took my bike, dad, like, insurance. We get a new one, yes! You know, like, this was life. Hotel room after hotel room for four years, I watched my dad slip out of his bed, get on his knees and start to pray. So. When Wendell Smith started this church in 1992, that was a decision to come off the road. Because we had been traveling our whole lives. I was homeschooled for a lot of my life. I know that explains a lot about my social skills. But this is what we did. Went to London, went to every state in this union except North and South Dakota because we weren't sure anyone was there yet. <laughs> Kind of true. And so I just, my whole life was, this is what we do. I got invited at 16 years old to speak my first week of revival meetings in Alaska. And the reason was because they wanted my dad. He said no. They wanted Pastor Jude, our youth pastor. He said no. And he said, we have a 16-year-old young man. He's Wendell Smith. Wendell Smith's son, send him up here. So me and my sister, she was 18. I was 16. We went to Alaska. She did the morning meetings. I did the night meetings. Not my idea, it's because she was a woman. True story. Only the men could do the night meetings. Ridiculous. Anyways, I preached the same sermon for six nights straight in Alaska. People started getting saved. I was like, this is fun. Started traveling full-time when I was 19. 
Went to the craziest tent revivals, wild stuff. If I could tell you stories, crazy stories, deep in Canada, up in those islands, up in Canada, it was awesome. My life was changed. So you understand, I was predisposed, uh, my predisposition was to get out and get the message out. I was raised by an evangelist. We started a church, but it's in my DNA to take the message as far as it'll go. So this shouldn't be a surprise to you that the, the church home is changing. The goal was never to sit in a room, lock the doors, and make sure our lives were convenient and comfortable. It was always gonna happen. It was always gonna happen, right? It's like Michael Jordan gets drafted by the Chicago Bulls. If you watch him at North Carolina, I'm not talking about I'm Michael Jordan or Wendell Smith's Michael Jordan. I'm just talking about you look at athletes, like you watch Tiger Woods as a kid, you're like, he gonna be, he's gonna be good at golf. I see the trend, he's going to be good at golf. Watching the Kanye documentary, have you seen Kanye as a kid? He's wearing clothes no other kids are wearing, talking like no other eight-year-olds talk, and you're like, oh, he's gonna probably, you understand I was raised by a preacher, I traveled state to state, all I knew was when you get touched by God and consumed with his story, you take it to the streets, that's what you do. So you have to know that it's in my DNA, in the DNA of my family, that we're not going to keep this on Rose Hill. Meanwhile, here comes the technological age that meets us at our age and suddenly it's like, we could have a part in changing the world. I told the prayer team downstairs between services, they've known me since I was 13, that we're gonna have a church of millions in weeks. Last week, 569,000 people logged on to be a part of our community. In weeks, we'll be at millions. And then what I wanna do is I wanna build a technology that other churches can use and they can get to millions. So before we know it, we got churches of millions who don't depend on a personality in a room necessarily, although this, both and, both and, both and, we're not doing away with this, it's both and. But the times we're living in are exciting, but please know who you have in this guy. I remember the time where honestly, we didn't have money because Chelsea's dad hadn't sent the check yet. And grandma was still married to one of the poor guys. <laughs> I'll never forget one of the places we were speaking. The pastor said, I wish it could be more. And trust me, we wished it could be more because it didn't cover our bills. I said, dad, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to believe God. I was 10. We're going to believe God. We're going to believe God. Okay. <sighs> okay. There are people in this room, you are avoiding the decision you know you're supposed to make and it's like ruminating in your head and it won't go away and you keep rebuking it. But what you know and I know is the reason it keeps surfacing in your thoughts is because it's the Spirit of God trying to guide you into the unknown. <laughs> we will not stay scared in a room. That is not our heritage and that is not our future. No more fear-based decisions. Perfect love casts out all fear. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, God says. Any decision based on fear is not a good decision. And every decision based on faith, I cannot promise, is a safe decision. So what are you going to do? Because every decision you make by fear is not a good one. But every decision you make by faith is not a safe one. So go live your life. And God will be with you. But you st today you have a decision to make. And what will the next generation see and believe? What will they see and believe? Uh, but the second observation, and I'm almost done. I've already said it, but we don't have to stay in a room and we won't stay in a room. Jesus, help me. I'm almost done and I know this is wild. When did the room become synonymous with the church? When did 
let that happen. Because on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus walked through the walls to get his followers out of the room. Judah, why aren't you in the room? Why do you think? Because if this becomes what we are, we're not being true. This is not, this is where we gather to be equipped. And by the way, he still walks through walls so we don't stay here. I will forever, as long as I have breath, I'm going to be your local church pastor that's going to be, and I might be the only preacher you got left telling you this. If you need to move from Seattle, you move. You hear me? If this room empties because we all move, let God lead. This community will not exist merely because there's a room full. This community will exist because our hearts are full with Jesus. And that full heart with the reality of the story of Jesus and his magnificence and magnanimous ways and his resurrection power, it moves us. What is the operative word of our belief system? What is it? Go! Go! Don't you pass on to the next generation. Stay when the word is go. And I yell because I'm happy and passionate, not because I'm mad and angry, just to be clear. (laughs) it cannot we cannot we cannot we cannot we cannot pass the baton to the next generation stay comfortable air-conditioned big buildings suburban america (laughs) pastor preaching in the same room every week just the way you want it here grammy award-winning artists producing albums you love here that's the Polarizing political opinions. Christianity. Take the baton. And my only prayer is that if that baton is ever attempted to be passed, that the next generation says sincerely and respectfully, no. Um, He lived. He lived perfect. For three and a half years, his teachings changed the world. And then he died like the prophets prophesied 700 years before. And then he rose again like the prophet. And what he claimed, and he's alive, and the tomb is empty. And his spirit is in you and on you and among you. Now go, son, into the highways and the byways. Science teacher, you go to that classroom every day under the overwhelming sense that the divine has revealed himself in the person of Jesus and he's alive. You go to your classroom with purpose. Yes, sir. And may God be with you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. Thank you, sir. We need less preachers and we need more followers. We need less exchange of ideas and we need more people involved in each other's lives. Son, um, you love Jesus? Yes, Dad, I love Jesus. They'll know you're Christians by your love. Take it. My time's up. Dad, what does that mean? He'll show you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, sir that baton when did safe living become a favorite topic of preachers in this country you might lose your business and God might work it for good I'll pray that your business prospers but if it goes away let God be God and what we pass to the next generation is not a pathway to mere temporary, finite money in the bank, but it's the true riches, human beings and souls. Love your name. Yes, sir. 
And I promise you this much prophetically, church, if the gathering in rooms ever keeps us from loving our neighbor, God will do a new thing. And he is. And he is. And the boomers and the Xers may not totally get it, but watch out. This next generation is going to think it's the norm. God is everywhere and God can do anything, you know. And here's what I end with. What every Christian needs to remember is we don't have to stay scared. We don't have to stay in the room. No more safe living. No more fear-based decisions. And lastly, if it's true, then let it be true. If it's true, then act accordingly. I felt like God said the other day to me, he said, I want you to treat me like I resurrected. I want you to relate to me like I'm God. Think about all the things you'd say to God if God was with you and you knew it for sure. Right? That's why nothing is too difficult for God. But if he rose from the dead, the scripture says that in fact we are not pitiful people. We are people of purpose and redemption and forgiveness and power. If the resurrection happened, church home, act accordingly. Think beyond finite linear time and space. Think eternal. Listen to the one man who came from heaven to earth. Listen to his priorities. Listen to what matters. Listen to what he focuses on. Watch him care for humanity and act accordingly. Let opinions fizzle. Let the truth prevail. Let God's people be seen in the highways and the byways and the barrios and the ghettos, and let us be seen caring for our fellow man. Where there is pain, and where there is strife, and where there is division, and where there is injustice, let us be seen standing with love. But that's where he is. May we pass that to the next generation. With tongue in cheek, I say, forgive me, church, but I don't mean it. Forgive me for leading this church in a way where I truly believe the resurrection happened because it has changed the trajectory of this community. Our goal is not just to fill one building in Rose Hill, nor can it be, nor should it be. Though Rose Hill is your home and my home and the home of Costco, for goodness sake. Our vision has never been Rose Hill. It's included Rose Hill, but we've always believed, just as Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Forgive me for saying, I don't mean it tongue in cheek, forgive me for saying, but we are an ends of the earth kind of church. You hear me? We're an ends of the earth kind of church, and we're gonna go to the ends of the earth because God has given us the opportunity and it's because of you and your faith and your generosity and your lead in and your passion. So this is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to the ends of the earth. And when I say, forgive me, I don't mean it. But I do ask that we walk circumspectly and sober-minded, remembering that our days are but a vapor and short. So let us live them to the fullest. And the message is clear. Leave this building and love your neighbor. Don't leave this building and be rude to the server at Chili's. Don't you do it. And if you do, tell them you don't go to church here ever. <laughs> when you leave the little tip, tell them church home's the worst place ever because then they'll know that's probably a good place because they're stingy. You're stingy, not us. A meme came out from the millennials, not the boomers, a meme came out and it was a woman lifting her hands in church and then she's 
at a brunch being rude to a server. And they, and someone, one of my friends that doesn't know Jesus, sent me a text on a Sunday one time and he said, happy Sunday. And I thought, my non-Christian friends get us better than I think. We will not leave this room scared. We will leave this room in love. Perfect love. You want to overcome fear? I'm done. I got to put the baton back. A man who will never be able to sing. There we go. Sorry, I took your baton. The only way to overcome fear is not saying no fear. The more you talk about fear, the more fear becomes a part of, uh, of, of, the, of the program. You, you, perfect love, perfect love, perfect love, perfect love, perfect love, perfect love, perfect love. Jesus said, look at the nail prints in my hands. Look at my side. They said blood and water flowed out of his side because his heart burst. He literally died of a broken heart. It's actually scientifically proven when they pierced him, the blood and the water flowed, which is also a type and a shadow of the church, that blood and water flow when something is birthed and the church was coming out of his side. The church was coming out of his broken heart. Who is the church? Oh, it's not a building. It's not a parking lot. It's not a program. It's people walking and talking and living and loving with their neighbor. That's what the church is. And he died of a broken heart so he could give birth to your mission and your life and your path and your purpose. And then he rose from the grave to say, everything I've said is true. Woo! So that's what we're going to do. And I get excited about it. And you know, there are some Sundays where I'm just at home now. You won't like this. And you know what I'm doing? Talking with my neighbors. And you know what's here? A video of me preaching. And you know what you can do? Understand why I'm doing it. Because I need to love my neighbor too. But if I'm too busy preaching every day of the week, then I'm only a preacher and not a follower. And these preachers are a part of the community too. This is my family and this is my church. I've been here since I was 13. You are my people, this is my home. I was not a preacher first. I was a 13 year old kid that Alan Stinnett was praying that God would do something with his life because he, he looked odd. Not, not Alan, I did. So you raised me. So understand, you raised me. This is my family. But I will not just be your talker. I want to be amongst you and living with you. And some Sundays, I can use a video so I can be home meeting my neighbors, throwing barbecues, and caring for them because that's a priority. Why don't you do it other days, Judah? Because people are home mostly on Saturdays and Sundays, church. So I'm the preacher who's saying, why don't you skip coming here sometimes? Maybe not Easter. We need to see each other. Why don't you stay home sometimes and fix a barbecue for your neighbors and pay for it all and see who comes? They all will. I won't tell you who, but recently a member of our church, they took a portion of their tithe and they bought a bunch of alcohol and a bunch of barbecue and they invited the whole neighborhood and they all came because who doesn't like free alcohol and free barbecue? <sighs> what are we doing? We gotta get out there. We gotta go. We gotta love our neighbors, and that's what we're gonna do. I'm still here. I'm still your pastor. We're building the church. Jesus is winning. He's resurrected from the dead. The best is yet to come. The path of the just is growing brighter and brighter with the growing day. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. God is not dead. He's alive. He's with us wherever we go. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. It is well with my soul, church. God is for us and God is with us. And I assure you that the end of the age of the era, though it may not come for the boomers or the Xers or millennials, I'm telling you when Jesus splits the sky with tattoos on his thighs as he returns on the white horse, he's going to come back for a beautiful bride and a glorious church. I'm done. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. I don't need, this is like those words just roll so easily out of my mouth. Thank you. 
Oh, wonderful Savior, thank you for life, resurrection, new birth, new beginnings, new starts, new things. You are great, and you are greatly to be praised. We love you. If you're here today and you say, Judah, I'd like to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'd like to receive Jesus Christ as my superhero. Jesus Christ as the once and for all sacrifice. He who knew no sin became sin so that you can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you want to receive this free gift, you don't earn it, deserve it, warrant it. You just accept it and receive it. If you want to receive that free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers on the count of three, whether you're watching somewhere in the world or right here in this room, I want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. You know who you are. Just shoot your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hands going up. Thank you. Thank you. We receive your forgiveness, Jesus. We receive your salvation, Jesus. You're everything we need. You're everything we want. We trust you and we worship you.